The expert fact is ridiculous. Yeah. I think that caused resentment. This is Bill Jones. He's from the UK, but has been in Singapore for 18 years. He's a charter surveyor, a unique expert who provides advice on real estate construction and property management. Bill told me what is special about typical Singaporean HDBs, what could happen with all the 99-year leases in the future, and talked about buildings that are hidden gems in Singapore. And Max, let's go. What was the biggest difference in Singapore since then, 18 years ago? compared to now. In those days, there were a lot of expats, a lot of people on, you know, major deals. And, um, you know, I think now it's more level. You know, there are uh, expats or non, non-Singaporeans non coming here, but it's more of a level playing field now. I think yeah. in those days, there were a lot of people here. No more packages, like no more ex yeah, expat packages. Yeah, anymore. the expat packages were ridiculous. Yeah. I think that caused resentment. And really so, you know, there were people who worked hard in Shell who were Singaporeans, Malaysians or whatever. and. Um, but they, you know, they were basically doing the same job, working just as hard, but being paid, you know, a, a fraction of what uh, expats are being paid. The other difference, as you can see outside, yeah, the built environment is is, is mushroomed significantly. You used to see open fields, and Singapore still has lots of greenery. And it's still got that balance, but it, it's expanded massively. Kampong, that village feel is gone. It's pretty much gone, really. It's, mm -hmm fully urbanized uh, environments right, right the way across Singapore. There are, I think there are like a couple of places in the heartlands, like still Kampung, so like one Kampung, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Have you been there? Yes, mm, I have. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's the only one. Of course, below Ubi and offshore, there's still some of the old village type houses, the old sort of houses on stilts, the old longhouse type of thing, yeah. Do you think they all began at some point? I think so that will be retained. So there was uh, maybe that the village, you know, that one last in Hellpole will be retained, but It'll be more of a sort of a tourist piece than yeah. a real life camp on Singapore. We'll never go back to that course. It will always, you know, it will continue to be, you know, so to grow bigger and higher and more densely populated. What's the unique less about HDB? Because it's like basic design and it's supposed to be affordable housing for Singaporeans. But I'm sure there are like they researched a lot before like, coming with the. A, like proposal for how HDB should look like. When they were setting them up, they, they, the um, the original people involved, including some of the chartered surveyors who worked for the ACB, would go out and they would look at what um, size units people's, people needed. They looked at population growth. They looked at what the family unit size was. They looked at the um, you know um, you know male to female ratios. Looked at how what would be the optimal size unit mm -hmm. for for people in Singapore. So they did all of that to work out what sizes would be best. And not only that, they looked at the, as you say, where people worked. And obviously now you've got things like the um, the developments of the MRTs to enable people to be able to get from their home to work very, very quickly and to get around the island very quickly as well. Oh. So it's all interlinked. So it's all part of that, um, how say that you are a master plan. And the HDBs are all linked into all of that. So it's not just about the the physical size of the units, the construction. It's also about the roads that link in and the infrastructure. And I think it's, uh, you know, the designs, they say that you could say they're basic, but they're very effective. I think that's the word I'd use. Very effective. What's the oldest HDB? The original ones in Tiong Bahru, the oldest ones of all, they're 1939, 1940, yeah. and very few. They're very cool, actually. Yeah. All the Art Deco style of balconies, they're the, they're the sort of way they, 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 it's all uh, curves. It's not that sort of and uh, squares, it, there's all the nice curves and shapes, the horseshoe shapes and all that, yeah. But they're like, I think, five, six story maximum, the height. Yeah, exactly. So it's, exactly. it's not what works in Singapore at the moment. No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> what about condos? What's the oldest condos in, in Singapore? First condo starts to be in the 1960s. Like, yes, it, yeah. it, in my book, I'm getting plugged for my book, but... We'll leave a link uh, for the book in the description if you guys want to buy. Yeah, go for it. Some of the um, chartered surveyors from Singapore, by the 1960s, there's a mixture of expats and, and locals. And <laughs> those locals, uh, you know, like um, Willie Go, studied in, and uh, lived in the UK and then came back to Singapore and set up their own businesses. And some of those businesses were involved in the development of condos for oh. some of the rich Chinese families who had cash and wanted to do something with it. So, well, <laughs> let's, let's build some real estate. And, you know, sell condos and you know, and generate some, some, uh, some cash through that. And it, you know, it it started back in the '60s. Another proponent of that was uh, CDL, you know, City Developments Limited. Again, chartered surveyors, both 
um, expats and locals were involved mm. in CDL in their early days in the 60s. And they did some developments in, not only in Singapore, but also in Joe Barrow, yeah. uh, the first condominiums developments in Singapore. So it goes back to the 60s. You know, that's right. And uh, obviously now it's an integral part of the uh, the residential landscape. But uh, back then, they were real pioneers. It was mm. a real risk they were taking to build condominium developments and sell, you know, sell these 1990-year leases of these sort of condos to people. It was a real risk they took, and mm. it worked out for them. But, yeah, it was uh, unknown territory back in the 60s. Why was the risk? Because 99 years lease, like, doesn't doesn't feel right? Well, yeah, I think there's that, but also it was the fact that they, they didn't know whether people would buy them. Yeah, so the expat community is expected to live in houses, and um, the rich locals as well lived in houses. Yeah. No, people didn't live in, in condominiums, so... There was no such a concept, I guess, as Exactly, yeah, yeah, that's right. So the idea of saying to people, actually, you know, you're going to live in a condominium block. That was something that had never really been tried and tested. The, the concept... You know, a place like London, they existed in oh. Europe, mm. but in Asia, they didn't exist. So it was a really was sort of a leap into the unknown. So I'm um, mm. expecting people to put money into a development and uh, take that risk was was another uh, leap of faith. But it turned out to be a great decision. Well, that's right. Yeah, that's trade. right. Yeah. I was always like curious. Okay, 99 year lease ownership so actually for let's say europeans it doesn't sometimes it doesn't make sense because they're they're 99 year old like building in france is like brand new building you know it's it's very it's very yeah, different different, yeah. different uh, mindset i think but if let's say there are a few corners like the big ones interlace reflections built like 10 years ago and it's like 99 year at least but then what happens you think with these buildings in like 50 years and 60 years they probably because singapore like re rebuilt rebuilt buildings uh do you think they will still exist or 99 years it's much more than actually the the life the lifespan of the typical let's say condo it seems to be the typical way yeah it's weird at the moment because people buy them but they often when the leases are halfway through they're, they're hoping there'll be a buyout and that there'll be a developer will come in and um they look to redevelop. That is obviously relies upon Singapore building higher and taller because they, if, if you're looking to build the same on the site, then the increase in value is not going to be there. But if you can build another five or six stories and build it bigger and higher, then it's uh, obviously developers are going to be interested. There could be a push for more retrofitting and the government may in 20, 30 years say, sorry, we, we, we can't carry on knocking down condominiums and rebuilding, we just don't, can't do it anymore. Uh, that could create uh, a challenge. And if that does happen, then people may what, say, well, actually, if you as a developer, if you have a 999-year lease on your side, we want a bit longer, we want 150 years. That may well happen because people, if people can't see redevelopments and can't see the, um, I should say, some kind of uh, future value, then... A 99-year lease, you know, if you live there for 30, 40 years, once you reach the halfway stage, your value will start to drop, you see, because, you, you know, it comes to the end of the lease, and, you, know, you're, you know, you're going to have to pay another premium to buy another 99 years. So I can see if there was a drive to retrofit, then there, there could be a challenge to the 99-year and all. Where developers are getting freeholds, so they, you know, there are some freeholds out there, or they're getting 999-year leases from the government, then... Which is technically free. Yeah, yeah, nine, nine, but nine, technically nine, freehold. Then people, my view is, if it was me, I'd be saying, well, I want 150 years, thank you. Because, you know, cause, you know, you've already seen it already in some places like uh, in Gayland, you've seen people who bought houses on 99-year leases, and it comes to the end of the lease, and, um, you know, they either got to pay for another lease, or you know, pay to extend for 20 years, or even pay a premium to do that, which is very expensive. Or, you know, in some cases, the government have come in and said, well, actually, no, we're, uh, we're going to have... You know, we want to redevelop this, and you've got no right to extend. So that's the end. You know, bye bye. What are the the hidden gems in Singapore that people don't really, even Singaporeans, they didn't know they, they exist in Singapore? The top three that come to mind. Some of the ones for me, the interesting ones, are things like uh, Goodwood Park Hotel, mm. which originally was um, a club for uh, German expats. So it was built pre World War One. It was uh, built as sort of it's called the Teutonic Club. Uh, so that's where the tower is, like a bit like a German castle in a way. And that was built as a club for 
German expats, and you know, it, it pre World War One, you know, there were a large number of German expatriates in Singapore doing various uh, commerce, commercial jobs around in Singapore. World War One came, and um, they left, and it, you know, it, it, it's um, it became a hotel, and uh, there's no good good park hotel. And it's a it's a magnificent building tucked away on Scotts Road, and uh, you know, it, all the time it was. Um, Probably one of the go-to hotels in Singapore. Not so much now, but it's a fantastic place to go and have a walk around inside and see what it's like inside. The AIA Insurance Building, which is yeah. in Finlayson Green, I mean, it's now um, Ascot. 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 Okay. So it's basically um, serviced offices, service departments. Magnificent building. Again, look at the outside. Go inside and have a, have a nose around. Again, chartered surveyors were involved in the construction of that. So it's a beautiful building. Number three, house number one. So Czech Jawa is on Pulau Wubin. Yeah. It's the only house in Singapore with a fireplace. In the UK, it was constructed oh. by a Welshman called Langdon Williams, who was chief surveyor in Singapore back in the 1930s. And he built it for his wife and himself to go to the weekends. It was a holiday retreat. They had a house in Singapore, which again was, uh, they designed and built, but uh, he was an architect as well as being a, a building surveyor. So he was a building surveyor, but he also compromised as an architect. He had that place built for himself, and because you know he wants this sort of a Tudor-style old house in the British style, he had that built for himself, and he had a fireplace put in, so they could actually light fires, Ooh. incredibly, which is thing in Singapore, why would you light a fire? Because it's total madness, and you've got a chimney staff, as you can see, so... Uh, <laughs> the, the only reason he did that was so he could feel at home, feel as if he was back in the UK. So is, the, is it like is it the reachable for public? Is it yes, for public? you can yeah. go in and see it. Yeah, oh. remember if you're on Kulau Ubin, you can go and visit it. So it's uh, just someone live there, or it's like a museum. It's a museum. Uh, since you're here for 18 years, would you ever consider to become a Singaporean? Yes, I would. Um, it's something that I've um, been thinking about. It's something I should have done earlier and didn't do. It's not so much that you want to cut your ties with your your own country. It's just that you think about the process of doing it and you think about how long it's going to be. And you've got a busy life, you've got a job, you've got other outside interests like writing a book. And yeah. um, you think, well, I'll do it when I've got more time. So it's not that you don't want to do it, it's just that you, you need to find the time to do it. So maybe uh, it's something that I should um, increase, the, you know, puts the top of my uh, to-do list. You know? What would be the benefits for you if you become Singapore? For the benefits, I would say because of the, um, I mean, it's... There's a whole range of benefits. One is health-wise. I mean, I just hate the cold weather. So, <laughs> so, so being here is fantastic, you know, yeah. weather-wise. It's just the lifestyle here is so much better than other countries. But I mean, you can proceed living with a PR and like just continue living, being... You like yeah. could. I mean, I, I could continue being a PR. You know, that still is an option. You know, that is definitely uh, an option I could consider just doing that. But um, equally becoming a citizen is... Um, actually, Singapore's been good to me, so maybe I should, you know, yeah. think about becoming a citizen because I've not really got the intention of leaving, so, yeah. You know, my grandma used to say, if you watched just one YouTube video, you're already a good person. But if you watch a second one straight away, you're an incredible person. So do it right now. Don't upset my grandma. <laughs>